All right, everybody. I'm Jay. I'm also one of the other PGY3s, and I'm going to present a little bit on pediatric nephrolithiasis, and I'll attempt to explain while it's more than just a stone, and we've heard a little bit about that from our first presenter. So for introduction, um, nephrolithiasis in kids is less prevalent than it is in the adult world, but it's been well documented that over the last few decades, the incidence has been increasing. So if we look at a study from 1999, the, there was 18 cases per 100,000 kids, and about 15, 16 years later, that number is almost increased by three and a half times with 65 cases per 100,000 kids. And as we also heard earlier, it's not only um, the incidence is increasing, but of course, it's also becoming more costly for our hospital system and health system. Um, over this 15 year, 15 year period, there was a 20% increase in hospital associated costs, 18% increase in hospital admissions, and a 9% increase in ED visits for kids with kidney stones. Um, and you know, compared to adults, stones and children are this slightly different. Of course, they're less common. Of the total burden of nephrolithiasis, kids represent maybe one tenth. Um, but there's also no gender difference in kids. In adults, males are more likely to have stones, but in kids, it's relatively similar. Um, and then, you know, almost every time I see a kidney stone patient, they always ask me, why did I form this stone? And in adults, it's really hard to answer that question, especially in the ED. Um, but in kids, you are more likely to be able to answer this question as an underlying risk factor is identified in up to 90% of cases. And so there's, um, and this, this uh, has implications for management further. Um, and like I'm saying there, these kids are more aggressively um, evaluated because if you are able to identify the cause of their stone, then you can make some changes in the medication and diet to try to prevent recurrence. Um, and then finally, as we also heard, I think there's a really big emphasis on multidisciplinary care um, for the management of kids with um, kidney stones, um, more so than in the adult world, where we really want to have a nephrologist involved. And I think as we go through the metabolic risk factors, you'll see why. Um, it's a lot of this stuff is really um, complex and beyond the scope of a general urologist or an endourologist although we have great endourologists. Um, and then a couple of other things I just kind of found um, interesting is that there's a, a really well-known risk factor um, of some seizure drugs and their association with development of kidney stones. But it's not as simple as just stopping the drugs because a lot of times if their seizures are well-controlled with the drugs and it's something that it's... Um, you know, it's a risk benefit analysis. And so I found that interesting. And then also in kids, you know, a lot of the general advice we give to adults with stones is to limit their protein, animal protein intake. But that advice for kids is a little bit fraught because protein is important for their development and you want to be careful having them restrict protein intake. So um, finally, we just show that uh, the composition for stones in children and adults is different. And um, for their uh, primarily stru struvite stones are more common. They're related to infections, but also, um, you know, a calcium oxide or calcium phosphate stones should absolutely be worked up to rule out some of the metabolic causes that we're going to discuss. And we'll go through all of these. So um, as far as the cause of stones in kids, there's three kind of causes or risk factors. Um, the first is a metabolic. And uh, we heard briefly that metabolic um, uh, stones can either form by having too much of a soli solute, either it's being excreted too much by the kidneys, or there's low urine volume from dehydration, and there's a supersaturation of the solute. Or the uh, um, contrary where that a stone can form is um, if you have decreased concentration of stone inhibitors, and classically this is for citrate. Um, so 90 up to 90% of cases, we can identify something wrong with metabolics in children. And um, the other risk factor is an anatomic risk, risk factor. And this is up, up to 25% of cases. And of course, for anatomic problems, it's kind of related to flow and physics. As there's obstructed flow, the urine doesn't, is, you know, there's urinary stasis and this leads to stone formation. And some classic anatomic pr problems we see in kids like UPJ obstruction and horseshoe kidneys, kids with polycystic kidneys, neurogenic bladder, bladder extrophy augments, all of these anatomic issues can predispose kids to the development of stones. And then finally, infectious um, risk factors. So up to 25% of kids have a history of a urinary tract infection. But the question is, does the infection cause a stone or are the kids predisposed to infections from anatomic things? And that's why we're seeing their infections as well. Um, but regardless, these um, infectious stones are often struvite. Okay, so I'll go through some of these metabolic risk factors. It's uh, very medical. Um, 
but I'll try to just highlight some of the important things and hopefully give some pointers for exams. Um, so hypercalciuria, this is the most common metabolic risk factor, too much calcium in the urine. How can this happen? Either you're absorbing too much calcium from the intestines, you're losing it in the kidneys, or bone resorption. Taylor highlighted nicely a case of somebody with osteogenesis, osteogenesis who's probably having um, immobilization and leading to uh, increased absorption or bone resorption and then calcium. Um, another thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is both uh, medications for steroids and diuretics. These are important causes of stones and important to review, especially in kids with um, syn syndromes or multiple medical comorbidities to look for these medications as they may be causing stone formation. Okay, and then um, next most common metabolic risk factor is hyperoxyuria. This is up to 10 to 20%, um, commonly idiopathic, but the really important thing to rule out is uh, autosomal dominant primary hyperoxyuria. There's, um, this is a, a, a rare uh, disease, but it is associated with an extremely high risk that these kids will go on to develop uh, end-stage renal disease before they reach their adulthood. And so um, more than half of these kids will develop this. So it's very important to identify these patients early because they can be managed uniquely. Um, I have a picture of this drug called uh, Lumis lumerusin, something like this. And um, it's a small molecule RNA inhibitor. So a very kind of unique drug, but it does have implications in reducing the progression. So um, this is one of the really big things to pick up so we can um, prevent these kids from developing kidney failure later in life. Um, another way that we can have more too much oxalate in the urine is from fat malabsorption. Um, so when you have too much fatty acid, it goes on to bind the calcium, and then there's less calcium that's available to bind oxalate. And when you have more free serum oxalate, that goes on to see um, to be filtered by the kidneys, and this can, can um, lead to um, kidney stones. And so we often see this in kids with inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, bowel resections who result in have short gut, or kids with cystic fibrosis or pancreatitis. So in general. Just like an adult, you want to um, decrease the oxalate by um, decreasing it in the diet, increasing fluids, and then using potassium citrate as needed. Sorry, there's a question. So, for diagnosing the autosomal dominant, is it just family history or is there a test? For there's a genetic test. Um, I think um, there's, there's three types of primary hyperoxaluria, and there is associated with different genes for them. Okay, so the next common metabolic cause, and I think for a lot of kidney stone doctors, uh, these patients represent the most challenging patients, um, is patients with uh, cystinuria. This is an autosomal recessive disorder of the coal amino acids, um, but these patients, uh, they can be very challenging to manage because um, you have to make a lot of changes to their diet. They have very strict diet and medications. And so in kids especially, um, this is a, a great population for a multidisciplinary stone clinic because of the um, challenge in managing them. Okay, so finally, um, the last solute is uric acid. So uh, pure uric acid is rare in children, less than 5% of stones. And the causes of uh, excess uric acid is um, similarly either too much production or too much excretion. Um, when it's idiopathic, it is often associated with uh, calcium issues. Um, and then when it's from a production issue, it's often in kids who have um, blood problems like uh, myelodysplastic problems, blood dyscrasias, leukemia, lymphomas, or uh, genetic disorders. And then um, for high purine diet can cause um, high uric acid. And kids, I don't think we need to worry much about them drinking alcohol or having liver for dinner or much seafood, but they may be drinking a lot of soda, um, which is a risk factor to be looked out for. Okay, so we've talked about the um, risk factors um, that for solute excess, and then citrate, of course, is this inhibitor. And just like in adults, it's a common finding in recurrent stone formers. Um, and we heard earlier that citrate inhibits the formation of uh, crystals and reduces um, kidney stones. And how, how does somebody have low citrate? It's chronically, it's associated with chronic metabolic acidosis. So um, when people have systemic metabolic acidosis, they have the, uh, increased proximal tubular citrate reabsorption, and that leads to decreased excretion. All that to say, you know, I think it's more important to know what's um, diseases and problems are associated with chronic metabolic acidosis and chronic diarrhea, patients that are having inflammatory bowel diseases, pancreatitis, CF, these patients are having chronic diarrhea and that leads to a metabolic acidotic state. And then um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So classically, we talked about Topamax, which is a very popular anti-epileptic in kids and also zenosamide. These medications um, have some carbonic anhydrase properties and they lead to stones and that's well documented. And then of course, renal tubular acidosis, both inherited and acquired forms can lead to uh, low citrate in the urine. 
Okay, so just as an overview, we went through several different solutes, solutes and metabolic risk factors, um, calcium being the most important solute and citrate being the most inhibitor. Um, and I think I hopefully show that there are a lot of different genetic issues and medical problems. So it's really important to have multidisciplinary care. Um, and just to conclude, I just want to just talk briefly about the workup for kidney stone, um, pediatric kidney stone patients. And the most important thing is, unlike adults, every kid with a, um, a kidney stone, whether it's passed or it's noticed on surveillance, should have a comp comprehensive evaluation. And so that includes a comprehensive history and physical, taking note of if they have any signs of other syndromes that may be associated with genetic disorders. It definitely includes getting in a nice diet history. Um, and then finally, you know, this is a big difference with kids is that we really need to work them up with labs. So they should have this full lab panel getting calcium, PTH, looking for uric acid, but they also should have a urine test done. Um, and so this is challenging in kids that are not potty trained because trying to get a kid that's not potty trained to do a 24 hour urine would be very challenging. So um, you could do a spot urine. And then if you identify anything in spot urine, that could lead to the need to potentially admit that kid and collect a 24-hour urine via a catheterization sample. But we really do need to make sure that we're also getting a stone analysis in these kids if they have a stone pass, because that can also show us if they have some rare or unique stones. So just to conclude, a few more comments, just to reiterate this point. For us, every pediatric patient should get stone follow-up. These kids, we have a really good chance at identifying a problem and reversing, re reducing the chance that they recur, and also reducing the sequela of kidney stone disease in kids. Can I interrupt one second? When does that end? When does uh, 18? <laughs> well, so the guidelines for adults say that if they're... Um, uh, if they have bilateral storm stones or if they're interested. Um, but I think after, after they have recurrent stones, you start working them up. <laughs> okay, great. And like I mentioned, um, you know, collecting urine is very important. And in young patients, obviously, we just to remember we have that option to use a spot urine and then to as a screening and then to escalate further to 24 hour urine. Um, and the results of these tests can really drive testing for genetic disorders. There's so many different genetic disorders with different mutations. And so the test for everything is really hard. But these, te these urine tests and the metabolic evaluation can help point us in the right direction. And then finally, just don't forget about the stone analysis. You know, finding a cysteine stone or uric acid stone really uh, kind of makes it easy to not have to go through all the, the urine studies, but it also has implications for treatment and management of these patients. So um, just to conclude and to reiterate, um, in kids especially, it's really important that these patients have a comprehensive stone clinic that has not only urology and nephrology, but a dietitian, which you heard is really important, nurse, case management, and social work. I saw some studies that when those patients have comprehensive stone workup, they have less imaging, they have um, better follow-up, less likely to have recurrence. So in the end, it's better overall for these patients. Uh, these are some of my references, and thank you guys.